Hello, guys. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. We're just waiting for a couple of people more to come, and then we're going to start in like two minutes and work our way through uh, our session. Thank you, guys, for being here. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. Our, our session, we, we are going to start our session now, and um, the, our session is, is about um, the landlocked developing countries and its relationship with the, with the world, and um, how we ask as developing, uh, developing countries with the landlocked situation can look beyond the isolation that is uh, our reality in uh, geographically wise. And it is an issue that we need to address in the digital age, where digital evolution, digital transformation sh should help us as landlocked developing countries to find ways to uh, belittle the situation that we are in and give us tools and capacity building regulations to make us stronger and better as countries and regions and make us better players in the international community. Uh, sometimes uh, the situation is not such. And um, 
Nalog developing countries are a group of uh, 34 uh, countries from all regions that have disadvantages because of their geographical location. So uh, we have for you tonight a very interesting panel with, um, with Jovan Corvalilla, the director executive from Diplo Foundation, with the, uh, the parliamentarian from Paraguay, uh, Sebastian Garcia, and with two youth ambassadors from, um, IGF ambassadors from uh, landlocked developing countries that I'm gonna have, um, I'm gonna give them the opportunity to, to introduce themselves and, and uh, uh, tell us about their experiences, both uh, on the level of uh, political commitment by developing countries and their own experiences here at the IGF. I'm gonna start to give the floor to Mr. Ivan Kurvalia to give us the, the standing remarks. Ivan, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Miguel. Uh, good evening. It's uh, great to see you here and uh, to have this, this, this session discussing an issue which I've been always thinking of um, as a specific issue, general, but also specific. I mean, landlocked developing countries face also common problems that uh, the other developing countries have when it comes to digital issues, especially to the question of, uh, of access. And uh, their uh, specificities, and it's good that Miguel, together with the other landlocked countries, you have been keeping this initiative alive at the IGF. Every, I think every IGF you keep the sort of dynamics about landlocked countries, sometimes together with small island states, sometimes uh, separately. And uh, that's important for the, for the few, few reasons. One reason is that most of the digital policy is usually discussed, arranged, and adjusted to the interest of the major players, people who are around the table, who have a chance to discuss uh, digital policy issues. And that's fine, obviously. The big countries like United States, China, European Union are uh, players that have uh, technical potentials, they have uh, big diplomacies, they have a uh, big interest. And it's in a way expected that they, they have the major presence in digital uh, policy negotiations. But countries like, uh, like uh, Paraguay, Paraguay and other uh, landlocked countries could also play an important role if they find a few niches of particular concern and interest. And one of definitely important niche for them is the question of access access to the networks, access to the uh, sea-based cables, and that's, that's, that's uniqueness in the question of the cost, additional cost for access and the other elements that uh, we are aware of. Now, one area where the new developments are happening in is in Euro-Asian continental mass, where many landlocked countries are basically located, and where the, for the first time in history, the major transit of the digital traffic is happening over the cables which are following uh, more or less gas, gas pipelines and railroads uh, developing one belt, one road project by China. This is an extremely important development because throughout the history, international data and telecommunication traffic has been going through the basically uh, seabed cables. If you follow the route of seabed cables today around Euro-Asian continent and also across Atlantic, you will see that they follow the same route as the telegraph cables which were laid 100, uh, 130 years ago. They go from the UK via Gibraltar, passing near Malta, Cyprus, uh, Egypt, Suez, Red Sea, India, around the Indian uh, subcontinent, Singapore, and then towards the north, north towards China or south towards Indonesia and uh, Australia. Currently, more than 90% of global traffic is going, intercontinental uh, uh, traffic among, between continents is going through these cables. For the first time, one belt, one road initiative is basically providing the landlocked countries with this fast access 
uh, because the cables will be available in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Central, Central Asian Republic. That is going to be the major ch challenges at the Euro, Euro-Asian land mass. I don't know specificities in Africa. They face also unique challenges when it, uh, for develop, uh, landlocked countries, and in Latin America, uh, these, these, these issues. But probably the <clears throat> one of the solution is to find this cost-effective approach, and there are some advantages for the land-based fiber optic cables comparing to the seabed. It's a cheaper to lay down, maintenance is easier, and there are quite a few advantages. Therefore, we may discuss today and develop these arguments. What would be, for example, argument of Paraguay to push for the, for the fiber optics laid across, across the Latin American and South American continent? And I can also share with you some research that I did on, that, uh, on, on, on this issue. That's, that's one, of, one of the, I would say, major advantage. The second advantage is, and it's also related more to Central Asia, there is also a battle for the data farms. Countries are trying to attract data farms. Usually landlocked countries have a bit drier and colder climate than uh, countries which are on the, on, the, on the seashore. Therefore, Central Asian Republic are considering considering also data farms because the climate is cold, dry, and there is a relatively solid supply of electricity because of Himalaya and the water which is coming to Himalaya. Therefore, we should look, I'm, I'm just mentioning two, two aspects. I'm, we should look the, for these counterintuitive elements that sort of disadvantage, in inverted commas, of being landlocked can turn into the advantage. I just want to throw these few ideas that we may, may discuss now in, in more details, but that's, that's basically uh, what, what, is, what, what is my initial input. Thank you very much, Ivan, for those uh, inputs. They were very, very interesting. And, and certainly one of the issues is uh, connectivity you know, for us to, to, to develop further. And um, uh, regionally-wise, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that need to be uh, further developed. But uh, um, I will now give uh, the floor to Representative Garcia from Paraguay, who will uh, show us a, bit, a little bit of the same uh, views brought from the side of uh, the, the Republic of Paraguay. Thank you very much. Mr. Garcia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Following on Dr. Jovan Kurvalija's point of view perspective, I have to say that I I liked his point of view, and I agree with it, with not seeing it all as a disadvantage. Uh, because in fact, uh, Paraguay, in our case, we have a, a, an electricity, a country that is very rich in producing renewable energy, and with, with basically unlimited, or at least uh, not unlimited, but with plenty of energy resources. Renewable, but renewable, by the way. But on the other hand, when we talk about connectivity, we face a situation in which today we are squeezed in the middle of big players, which are Argentina and Brazil. So in some way, due to how the uh, due to what the re how the due to how the region is going currently we face a situation in which we have to go through, undergo further negotiations. That is, we have to, uh, for connectivity, for proper connectivity, we have to go through a third party supplier, which is usually a, a private uh, telco. Uh, so this currently represents an, uh, an extra, an additional cost which makes connectivity in our country uh, uh, more expensive and, and, and of less quality than, than, the, than, than the standard, than the region standard. However, currently Paraguay is facing the, uh, is uh, carrying out a project called the Digital Agenda by the newly created ministry, uh, ICT ministry, which, uh, which is kind of being the new articulator of ICT public policies. 
on our side, from the um, uh, myself as chair and with the commission as chair of the ICT commission in the in the lower chamber, we are in a position in which we have to articulate with together uh, legislation with the ICT ministry and make sure it is uh, we make sure we include all uh, all other institutions involved in even even regulators all other institutions involved in the in order to make a good quality legislation in that way Go, uh, presenting uh, this the the, the situation the situation that concerns our connectivity creates certain doubts meaning that how can a, uh, raising raising questions like how can a country depend on the infrastructure of a private owned company in another country there's issues that concern sovereignty. There's issues that concern uh, that also go to, f for example, uh, that come all the way down to trade conversations. Meaning that if Paraguay is having issues with Argentinian customs to take products out through the river that takes that takes us to the, takes our goods to the sea. That could be used as a negotiation to, dis to put into discussion, put our connectivity into discussion. Uh, unfortunately, Mer Mercosur hasn't reached the, um, uh, the level of consolidation which we would have ex expected. Mercosur is the common market of, of the southern countries, which include Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and uh, adding in process of of adding Bolivia and eventually Chile. Unfortunately, the politics haven't allowed the, the common market to consolidate as it should, which creates certain doubts about uh, a very st uh, about stable long-term agreements concerning, because on one side, Paraguay has its way out to the sea through Argentina, and on the other hand, it has a big negotiation with the shared hydroelectric dam uh, Itaipu, which is in current process of renegotiation with Brazil, which, whose conditions have been set about 30 years ago, and which is a big uh, it's, it's a big discussion because of what it re of, of the of how much it represents uh, for Brazil's energy supply. So again. Any move that Brazil takes on one side or another could represent a, as a, a, some strat strategy to negotiate, and that could put connectivity not at risk, but could make it a, put, could make our future uncertain about whether we could have better and cheaper connectivity. So those are kind of the issues. Unfortunately, we cannot limit it to connectivity because of so many other aspects, so especially, especially uh, so many other aspects that are taken into consideration in diplomatic conversations. So it's, uh, we have to be very broad and very strategic when we consider our future plans, especially in carrying out this digital agenda in order to deploy the proper infrastructure that allows us to have proper backup with one country or with the other or eventually with Bolivia, which is our neighbor on the on the north border. But, uh, but again, it's a matter of being able to reduce, cut down these uh, asymmetries, and a, a way to properly uh, leverage advantages for uh, for further negotiations. So it's a way we have to uh, watch connectivity in a broad spectrum considering commercial aspects, considering further negotiations, and to in the long term, eventually, hopefully, we can, we can have uh, good results if the region uh, reaches its expected levels of consolidation. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for that. It, it was a, a very interesting point of view, particularly taking into account that regional policies and regional situations play a lot into our decision-making uh, needs. Um, 
I'm, I'm very happy now uh, to give the two youth IGF ambassadors the opportunity to, to be with us and, and, and to talk to us and show us uh, how are, uh, their countries doing things. So I will give the floor now to uh, the first of them and asking them to uh, tell us a little bit of yourselves and the 30-second clips of you and then talk up a little bit uh, for five minutes or so uh, about the situations in your own countries and how you see them uh, regionally because you are from as well different, different regions. So Innocent, you have the floor. All right. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Innocent Adrico uh, from Uganda. I am an ISOC IGF Youth Ambassador. Uh, it's an honor to talk about uh, issues related to, to uh, landlocked developing countries and uh, issues related to their accessibility to the internet and of course uh, all the issues surrounding the accessibility and uh, and uh, signal strength and uh, infrastructure. So I checked out a report by um, ISOC, uh, and uh, in this report in 2014, uh, the average cost to export for, uh, one container for a landlocked developed country was uh, 3,444 US dollars. And when you make the comparison, uh, uh, on the other side for transit countries, it was uh, 1,301 US dollars. When you check the importation, average imp uh, cost of importation, for landlocked developing countries, uh, it was 4,344 US dollars compared to 1,000 559 US dollars. That's already a challenge for us. In case we are talking about infrastructure in our countries, that's already a challenge because you can imagine that difference of for us to be able to, 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 to import or even uh, export. So when we're talking about the issue of uh, the landlocked countries, uh, we don't only look into the accessibility. I've looked so much into the infrastructure, for example, in Uganda. Uh, Uganda has struggled to make sure that it has good accessibility for its inter internet users, to the extent that in 2017, uh, in February, uh, Facebook announced a partnership with uh, Airtel, of course, Airtel Uganda. Uh, and this partnership was to build Seven, 767 kilometer, uh, kilometers of open access fiber backhaul in Uganda. So possibly to me, this was like, I think like uh, an idea maybe to make sure that uh, the internet users at least are able to access uh, a better co uh, service and uh, get better connectivity. And uh, this infrastructure was to enable deliver of uh, more connectivity services to a region of over three million people. Now, in Uganda, uh, most of the areas in Uganda seem to be rural. So that already creates a challenge. Like when you have this uh, fiber optic, you already have the challenge that you have to negotiate with your neighbor to get the fiber optic. And then you have to invest in two again, the, the infrastructure that you're supposed to build uh, in your country. So for us, uh, the accessibility in our rural areas, we do realize that it's not good at all. Like Our rural areas are not well connected. The internet connectivity is only good when you're in the urban area. So the question is always, what is the way forward for with landlocked developed countries, uh, I mean developing countries, like, especially like Uganda, given that also its policies actually are not that favorable because you're already hustling to get the connectivity and again the policies that you have in your country do not favor the connectivity because when you bring in policies like uh, people have to pay tax to access the social media, then they don't leak up at all. I don't, I don't know, like, 
I don't know whether it's the challenge that is bringing up to such policies because the government will be like, we are trying to raise, uh, we are trying to increase the tax base so that we can be able to pay the taxes. In Africa, uh, we do realize that uh, 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 internet users in uh, landlocked countries pay an average of 232 US dollars more per month for fixed broadband access than those in uh, coastal areas. And most of these countries, of course, uh, talk of Uganda, talk of Rwanda, uh, they're the ones that are benefiting on the coastal countries uh, of Kenya and uh, Tanzania. So it's all about how do I get the accessibility? After getting the accessibility, now the question becomes, uh, what next? Like, how do I make sure that my people get this connectivity? So that's always where the challenge focuses. And then uh, uh, it's good that uh, some of these countries have tried to embrace the challenge and have tried to look for solutions. Uh, because I was checking out uh, Rwanda, Rwanda illustra uh, has, has illustrated the possibility of uh, landlocked uh, nations uh, having cheaper uh, international wholesale connectivity prices than even the sea-facing uh, countries. In 2012, they, they signed up a 10-year agreement uh, with uh, the Tanzanian Telecommunications Company. And this, this agreement was to procure international bandwidth at an attractive price. So some of these countries have embraced the, the challenge, and they're trying to look for solutions to the challenge. I think so when we're talking about these challenges, we should also be looking into what next. Like, OK, we have agreed that we are landlocked. So should we just sit back and watch uh, uh, such problems that we are facing? or? We should look for solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Innocent, for that uh, intervention and for those figures. Uh, we usually tend to talk about policies and, 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 and forget the reality of the dollar in the pocket situation. That is a, a, a reality and, and it applies to logistics and to make decision making as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, Yudip, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Yeah. Hello, I'm, I'm Udi Baral from Nepal, and I'm also an Internet Society Youth Ambassador. Uh, high prices have hit many countries around the world, and Nepal faces uh, this problem. Uh, because we are a uh, land rock country, with a higher transport cost, delays less trade, and we have to reliable land, rock, uh, land transport with our neighbor country. Like in India, uh, we, we are relying the internet uh, connectivity from the India. And if there is a water tra transport, we can do more. We don't have choosing option at all now. That's why the, if, we, if, we, if we have a more uh, country connected, then a better option uh, uh, for the connectivity and will be affordable. Uh, so we have a north side China. And there is a Himalayan region where it's impossible uh, due to the weather condition. Uh, and also due to the monopoly, monopoly uh, we have to stick what they assign to us. This, uh, they, therefore, they, there is a big chance to, uh, for, the, uh, for the kill switch. Uh, and our government is also planning, to, uh, uh, planning for the third party's render, uh, where uh, there is a wireless technology. And uh, Nepal Telecom authorities uh, and Ancel, one of the biggest mobile operators uh, in Nepal, only have is uh, spectrum le uh, leasing because the government is having a maximum policies on that um, and have to invest a huge amount of uh, money on it. So it's uh, difficult uh, for the local ISP uh, and a small company to have a sp uh, spectral, uh, spectrum leasing. That, uh, that's, that's the things that we, our country is facing nowadays. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, indeed, uh, micro and medium companies are players that need to be nurtured and helped. And um, it gives us another layer of uh, things we need to think about when uh, developing and designing policies for our landlocked our developing countries. We have had the opportunity to hear from uh, 
a country from South America, a country from Asia, and another country from Africa, and as well uh, one of our very favorite uh, and very objective in, uh, institutions. And so I, I now would like to open the floor for anybody who would, would like to ask a question, and I would certainly encourage you to do so, uh, so we can get from so, some more perspectives from our panelists. I don't see any questions from the from the online participants, so I I will look at around the room and see if someone wants to start the conversation. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Good afternoon to everybody. And my name is Francisco, and I work with in in the telecom regulator of Paraguay. But I would like to speak as a master student and an economic stu student. <laughs> Because I think that the way of thinking that the extra cost we pay uh, for transport uh, in, in Paraguay case or to Brazil or Argentina may not be the correct way to, to, to think about the problem. Of course, it pays a role, it, 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 it pays a role. but maybe another big problem is that operators in Paraguay compete in infrastructure. We have like uh, four or five fiber backbones instead of having just one uh, shared with all the operators. Uh, so that uh, that raises the price for 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 people. Um, so I think that maybe we we need to make some policies and regulator that favor the infrastructure sharings, uh, so the operators will compete in services and not in infrastructure. So I, I think uh, that prices must fall. Uh, maybe there are some other factors that we are missing because we are seeing that the transport cost is the main problem, and so we lost sight of the rest of possible problem and, and pro possible solutions. Maybe other problem can be the price of spectrum. Um, maybe uh, as landlocked countries, we, we need to, to, to consider that the spectrum cannot be the same, uh, the same cost that, we, that in Brazil or Argentina or another country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for that. Those are, were very interesting uh, points of views. And uh, let me look at the panelists, so they, if they want to say a few words on that. Yeah, when you have to talk. Just one, one question. Uh, how did the Sharm el Sheikh conference address, how did the, the latest radio telecommunication conference address this question of spectrum? Was it discussed in Sharm el Sheikh? Unfortunately, I did not go there. <laughs> so, okay. but I, I don't know the, the results of, of the no, it's WRC. Interesting but to yeah, follow yeah. up on the ITU Sharm el Sheikh discussion yeah, yeah. on the. Yeah, just uh, last week, I think that the Paraguayan yeah. delegation went to Paraguay, so I don't, I didn't cross okay. with them. So, I, I, I really don't know what the result of the okay. WRC was. Sorry. <laughs> No worries, but I do. I can do say something about the World Relations Conference. Uh, that it, recently over, they uh, they touch upon the the spectrum situation, uh, and I, I think there's going to be a, a report on the guidelines on uh, how to how to determine indicators to uh, to go in the right direction of pricing and uh, dividing the different um, ranges of the spectrum that you have to take into account. Um, any any other one any other one with a question? Uh, if you're not on the table, you can ju just come to the table and ask. I don't think that is the case. So I would like to then give just uh, a couple of minutes to every panelist to close uh, with a few remarks, and I will uh, start in the same way that we did the first part. You want two minutes to close up? Thank you. Uh, I was particularly honored to have a. S chance to hear from uh, our youth ambassadors uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, their colleague parliamentarian from Paraguay, uh, and uh, th that was always always extremely useful. You you presented uh, really useful statistics uh, on both uh, Uruguay and uh, and uh, I'm sorry Uganda and uh, and Nepal, 
and we heard about challenges, really interesting challenges in Uruguay, which are uh, putting the question of connectivity into broader geopolitical context or geoeconomic context. As you indicated, the question of negotiations on connectivity is very often linked to the other negotiations on trade and other issues. And what you mentioned was interesting that probably for land countries, the solution, one of the solutions could be through regional uh, arrangements like Mercosur, and that's probably interesting vehicle, vehicle to do. If I, I'm, I know that uh, I, I sort of this session doesn't, don't, does not deserve the empty room because it was so interesting. I learned a lot personally, and thank you, thank you for that. And I encourage young ambassadors in particular to, to move with the full force to present their country and the cause and, uh, and uh, to keep this issue alive in the digital policy discussions. Thank you very much, Ivan, for those very encouraging words. Uh, I do believe that this issue uh, would deserve more attention, and it's very, very true. And, uh, well, uh, but every, everyone who is here is very important in order to take the message out. Um, with that, I will give your Honor, you have the floor, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, on our side, uh, I think we have to keep strong on pursuing a regional consolidation. Unfortunately, politics has, been, has not been a friend of regional, of this consolidation, meaning that uh, the changes that there have been in, in regional governments have been the, in somehow uh, have not helped this, this consolidation. I believe that common markets, regions have to go beyond their own governments. We have to build our institutions in a way that no matter who is in power, the, the, the institutions persist and the unification strengthens. Uh, on the other hand, internally, we have a big challenge because following, for example, this digital agenda I was, I was mentioning, which is the big project for, for especially for accessibility and for connectivity, uh, we have a, a challenge on ensuring that there is a proper governance of the main backbone that is being, uh, that is being put in place now because the, there is going to be a state-owned backbone there is a state-owned backbone that is being in, in somehow that is being somehow optimized. So we have to ensure the proper governance in order for this connectivity to, uh, in order for this to re, uh, turn into results for the people who who have to benefit from this accessibility. So yes, above all, we have a big challenge in building trustworthy institutions, reliable institutions that are able to negotiate properly and that are able to uh, leverage local interests and not only depend on one or on another neighbor, but to be able to, to be a, a strong player, to stand as a, tr as a strong player in the region because as I said, Unfortunately, the, our condition makes us uh, depend in a big way on, on, on our neighbors, so uh, a good, a proper relationship with them is, is always necessary. But we have a lot, a lot to offer, we have a lot of potential, which I think can, can make us a, a good strategic focal point for the, for the development, for the development in a of, of the region as a whole. Thank you very much, Mr. Representative, for that. Uh, those are very good remarks. Um, Innocent, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, in conclusion, I think uh, challenges are solved by, first of all, embracing them and uh, looking for solutions, as already said. So. Uh, they talked of cooperation. Cooperation is a very good idea uh, in that operators uh, can be able to agree, uh, to agree uh, 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 upon sharing some of the costs in, uh, involved in deploying these fiber backbones. 
So another solution could be operators can be able to uh, leverage their presence in neighboring countries. For example, we've seen, we've seen Sonatel uh, uh, linking Mali from the, uh, from the Senegal border. Uh, I mean, Sonatel has linked Mali from Senegal. So it built, actually, uh, it was able to, to, to link up the Senegalese backbone to the Mali border because it was, it was using the, 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 the advantage that they are present uh, in two countries, so they were able to use that advantage. So that can also be a solution. Thank you. No, thank you very much, particularly for looking for solutions. That is a very hopeful view of the future, and that's what we need from you guys. Yudip, you have the floor. Yeah, in Nepal, uh, we should also increase the local traffic uh, so that we can connect more. And that's the main thing that we should do in our country. Still, we are not getting connected uh, in the rural places because still in the rural places of Nepal, we are still lagging behind. And there is lots of needed, lots of infrastructure is needed. So we need to develop local content. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very time efficient. Well, uh, from my end, I would first like to, to thank you all for being here, for those who took, took the time to be here in the room with us and those uh, online. Uh, first, let me thank uh, both Representative Garcia and, and Jovan for being here and show, uh, and show us your, your experience, your expertise and uh, in these uh, very intricate issues. And to to our youth ambassadors, I would certainly like to say, particularly as an outgoing MAG member, that uh, it's in you that the future resides. And it is very important for you to understand that the, the world is uh, not ending in our own borders or in our re regions, and we need to be able to get the landlocked developing countries together and be a strong group of international negotiations as we are now. So uh, just uh, in, a, in, a, in a good tone as the discussions have been so far, um, be making the, the, the LLDCs stronger is making the transit countries uh, stronger and that in that relationship uh, the benefit should be mutual as in any relationship we have uh, anywhere uh, and any time. And uh, that's why we need to not only work between ourselves to, to understand our own needs, but we need to understand that uh, our actions as governments and as countries take effect in uh, our neighbors' um, livelihood as well, and not just the other way around. So we need to work in, in, a, uh, in a place of uh, peers with the transit countries. And that's why uh, there's a broader thing to talk about uh, from here to when you have the time to go to your offices and your houses. So thank you very much again for being with us and um, that would be the end of our session. Thank you very much.